newest thing gun gets my go It's a chalupa for you. Chalupa for you. Warning, the following episode contains movie spoilers. If you plan to see the movie we are speaking of in today's episode, we recommend you wait until later to listen to it. Hey folks, this is Rich Outfield. And Big Anklevich. And we're just going to pick up where we left off talking right. about X-Men colon? <laughs> no First colon. Class. We're back. <laughs> I think we're both in agreement that it was a good movie and it deserved to be seen. I think it does. Yeah, I think it was a it was a strong film, and I think maybe there's a possibility that it could still wind up doing well. We're recording this after the first weekend, and it didn't open as strong as it did. And if we go by recent trends, you know that's all you get in the summer is you get opening weekend, and then if that wasn't amazing then you know you, you drop off like 75 percent the next week so if you weren't at 120 the first week then you'll be down you know way below 40 when you'll you'll never make back the money that you need to make back but maybe for once it'll be one of those films where people say hey, yeah i went and saw it. that was good yeah you should see it it's possible that the drop-off won't be that bad and we have had a couple movies like Black Swan, or just Bridesmaids really recently that had good word of mouth and they lasted a long time. I mean, Bridesmaids just blew everybody away because mm -hmm. it made over $100 million already and didn't open that huge. It's just, it was one of those that people said, oh, you got to see it. It's really funny. And people continued to go see it. And I think a month from now, it'll, there'll still be people going to see it. Maybe X-Men will be like that too. I don't see it being a huge film or something like that, but I, I could see it uh, dropping off a lot less than uh, others have just because uh, it was good and people like I, like I have a friend who the week before it opened they were all talking about going to the midnight showing the night before and he was trying to get me to go with him but I had to work the next morning and I was just like I don't think I can handle the midnight showing and then be back at work six hours later or less so I begged out and I think he wound up not going at all I think he just never bought the tickets, and then he's like, oh, it's too late now, it'll be sold out, or whatever he was thinking, I don't know, but I don't think he ever even wound up going, so he may still go, and all his kids and his family all totally wanted to go, so maybe they'll make a big outing of it, and people like that that didn't wind up going out to see it, maybe they will now, I don't know. See, I'm not a big fan of Fox as a studio, mm -hmm. but hopefully they've got somebody in their employ with a brain who will put out TV spots that say, you know, hey, it's really well reviewed. So and so gave it four stars. Come see it, you know, and they and they they'll play it for the next couple of weeks to get people to go that maybe didn't go in the last two or three days. Because once you hear that it's really good, that somebody that you respect liked it, maybe you're willing to give it another chance. You're like, okay, I didn't like Wolverine, but somebody that hated Wolverine also liked this one. So I'll go see it. I'm, yeah, I don't know. The thing with prequels is they're still an unproven commodity. I don't think there was such a thing as a prequel before like 1984. That was when I first heard the term. And You uh, heard that term in 1984? Really? Well, when Temple of Doom came out, it was a prequel to Raiders of the Lost Ark. And, and they like, called it a prequel then? Yes. I didn't know that. I'd never heard that term until like they started making Phantom Menace. Okay. I'm way behind on all the hip jargon and the slang, I guess. Well, okay. I mean, I think people tend to think of those Star Wars prequels when they hear that P word, but we haven't had prequels for very long. Or, or I mean, is it a prequel or is it a reboot? It's clearly a prequel to the other X-Men or at least the Brian Singer X-Men movies. Yeah, it seemed to be. That was an interesting choice too. I mean, I don't support it, but the, that's interesting to say, okay, we're not going to start over, but we're going to tell an earlier story in this same movie universe. And at least they had costumes. But yeah, it was, it was an interesting choice that they made. And then there was talk when it was coming out that, you know, if it was well received, that it would essentially be a, a, a reboot. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, a prequel slash reboot in the same way that J.J. Abrams' Star Trek is a reboot you know, right. slash prequel. I don't know how well prequels tend to do, but uh, we're learning. There were certain things that you figured had to happen in this movie. And boy, all of them happened, didn't they? <laughs> right. So that's probably my chief complaint, is that they didn't leave themselves room to do two or three more. I mean, obviously they can because it's based on a 40-year-old comic book and, and with millions of characters and storylines and stuff. But yeah, you, you get a lot. And I guess this is the point where we say, spoiler alert, 
Ah, uh, yes, we should say spoiler alert because there's some cool stuff you don't if you haven't seen it and you're planning on it, we might ruin something for you. I, uh, three years ago, was it? The X Men Origins colon Wolverine came out, and the next movie after that, do you remember what it was going to be called? Uh, Magneto, X Men Origins Magneto. Right, X Men Origins colon Magneto, and that one. I don't think you actually it. say the colon. All right, that one had a <laughs> script written by David Goyer. And uh, Ian McKellen was committed to star in at least the bookends, you know, as, mm-hmm. as old Magneto looking back on his life. And it was going to tell the story of his career with the Mossad and his friendship with Charles Xavier and then the dissolution of their friendship. And uh, that one didn't happen and it's not going to happen. I guess yeah, it was swallowed up by X-Men yeah, First Class. A lot of that. But uh, yeah, a lot of those Although, points were still made. when it comes down to it... X-Men Origins colon Wolverine told a ton of the same crap that they'd already told in X-Men 2 and they just went ahead and did it again as though there was no other uh, Wolverine stories out there except for his origin so we had to do that. Well, I'll say the unpopular thing. I liked both X-Men Origins Wolverine and X-Men 3 The Last Stand. What? Uh, You know, if that makes me Hitler, that's okay. I, after being what? exposed to this movie universe that's not faithful to the comic books that I loved, I was more willing to just say, okay, tell me a story in your way. And I didn't have my guard up. And I mean, people were just furious with <laughs> X-Men 3. I, and I've heard people say, you know, I, X-Men 3 was a giant turd and somehow Wolverine was worse. And yeah, even <laughs> both of them are just like, oh, I had fun. Yeah, I did too. I, I didn't like them that much. I didn't like them as much as X-Men 1 and 2. It was just because their stories were a little less coherent, a little, it seemed like they had more stuff jam-packed in there to where they weren't able to give good treatment to any of the stories that they had was basically the problem. And did you find that to be the case in X-Men colon first class? <laughs> I'm, let's, I'll just call it first class from now on. You can do that. Or you could just call it X-Men first class. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure you don't have to say the colon. It's a silent colon. Yes. I wish you It's like when you, you say a question and you get to the end, you don't say question mark. <laughs> I'm going to start doing that. Uh, what, wait, what was the question? I've mark? forgotten what the question mark was. What was it? You were asking about first class. Oh, if I thought that there was too much story jammed into those. I don't think there was. I don't think it suffered. I mean, there were some things that I think it would have been better had they just let it go until the next one, but maybe they didn't expect there to be a next one. That's the feeling I got from it. It's like, we better tie up everything because we might not get another shot at this, Admiral. <laughs> Our cruisers can't repel firepower of that magnitude. Now, how, how spoilerific are we going to be? Oh, Can I talk let's, about let's the ending? Let's go all the way. We're going all the way? Okay, we're going all the way, folks. This movie seemed to be, they did various things in it that made it a prequel to those three films of the X-Men. Because they have Mystique, and she's done the same way as the with the feathery looking things that change her into whatever it is that she's changing into and they had a scene which people didn't know about we didn't uh, rish who is mr knows all the spoilers before the movie comes out did not know that hugh jackman was going to appear for a scene in this film i'm glad i didn't know and uh, yeah he appeared in the film and it was cool It was just a quick little throwaway scene, but it was Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. It wasn't just some guy with his hair combed up like Hugh Jackman. It was Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. And so that leads me to believe that this is a direct prequel to those films. But in the end of this film, Xavier's friendship with Magneto is dissolved. They're not, you know, he's gone off to form his brotherhood of evil mutants and uh, Xavier is doing his uh, school for the mentally challenged and gifted. You know, it's over there. But at the start of X-Men 3, we have a scene where Xavier's still walking, and Magneto is there, and they're younger, and they go to talk to Jean Grey when she's a child. It's one of those things that, that kind of bugs you. It's like at the end of 
the third Star Wars prequel where Padme dies like the day that the children are born and yet there's lines from Star Wars where he says he can only vaguely remember his mother and Princess Leia or no Luke says he can't remember at all and Princess Leia oh I can only vaguely remember I was very young conflicting things things that don't work from one to the other I I don't know that kind of bugs me does that bug you? About X-Men or about the fucking prequels? <laughs> about X-Men. We can forget oh. about the prequels. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I almost wanted not to enjoy this movie. I wanted not to like it, which I, I guess I, I'm that guy that likes the garage band. And then when you hear them on the radio, you know, you're, I don't like them anymore now that you know who they are. If I had to describe X-Men first class to somebody, I would say, okay, let's say that somebody took a book that you love. It's a book that both of us have read, uh, Harry Potter, and they turn it into a movie. But they turn Ron into a child molester, and Hermione is Harry's sister, and Voldemort and Snape are the same character, and Dumbledore turns out to be Harry's father, and all this. And they make this movie that's so completely, ridiculously unfaithful to the book. And yet, the movie is really good. (laughs) That's how I felt about X-Men First Class, because... It, it, it didn't even make an attempt to, to tie everything up to the way that the comics should be. Right. Although, although Magneto's origin is pretty much the way that we saw it in the movie. You know, I mean, he did hunt down war criminals and stuff after the war and became Xavier's friend. And they fought on the, along the same side for a while there. But, you know, just like introducing characters that weren't around until like the Ed Brubaker stories. He wrote this deadly Genesis story in like 2005 that introduced this character, uh, Darwin. And he was in the movie set in the 60s. And then the the gross angel, the gross dragonfly chick that came years and years later was there. And and, and so I have to divorce myself from what I love and what I know about the X-Men and just say, I enjoyed them doing this movie, you know, even though, like, Alex Summers is Cyclops' little brother, and he was Havoc in this movie, and yet, obviously, I guess, old enough to be Cyclops' father, (laughs) but yet they called him Alex Summers, you know? Yeah. So, there was that. I I guess I'm conflicted about that, Uh huh. because I really like the way that the X-Men are in the comics and feel like that's the way that they should be done. And they didn't, again, but yet I still liked it. Yeah, I don't know. I, I wonder if they're ever going to do one that's all that faithful to the comics. Well, someday somebody will get the reins and say, okay, I'm just going to tell Days of Future Past almost exactly the way it was in the comics. Because it was only two issues. If you could tell it as close as you could to the actual comics, gosh, that would just be a perfect movie-sized story. Or somebody will be like, okay, X-Men 14 failed at the box office we're going to reboot it again <laughs> and this time we're just going to have it be the the first five and we're going to have xavier putting the band together and, and who knows it would be really neat to see somebody try it i, I don't think anybody has done anything as faithful as watchmen did and i there i know there are still two or three people that complain about them changing the end of watchmen <sighs> sigh but again you know what watchmen didn't shape my adolescence right you know it, it's not something that i built my moral compass on like Spider-Man and the X-Men are to me. And so, you know, I'm not as protective about it. But I, I've heard other people, you know, be even louder and more, you know, vehement about X-Men First Class not bothering to be faithful to the comics. And so I am conflicted, too, because I recognize that Xavier didn't lose the use of his legs because of something that Magneto did. I don't know. Maybe it's better than what Claremont did. I, no, I shouldn't say that. Well, it can, I mean, it can happen sometimes. I mean, like you said yourself, uh, the Spider-Man origin was done even better than it actually originally was when... uh... It was, yeah. The way they tied the burglar to Uncle Ben was much better than the way they did it in the comics. So sometimes things can be improved in the films. And I guess jumbling characters up from here and there and everywhere kind of is confusing. But yeah, I mean, it's a 40-year-old comic book. You've got lots of characters to choose from, so you can go there and do that kind of stuff, and it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, you just got to kind of look at it, I think, more as this is a one-off, a limited series that somebody has decided to write. 
look at it as just one of those little series that you can collect. They can set it in whatever world. It can be like Superman Red Sun or something, you know. It's got nothing to do with anything. It's just somebody ta- doing a completely different take on Superman. So, you know, you can just do that. And I guess that's kind of what these movies are, is they're more just somebody doing their own take. They're not taking a story that's already been told and telling it again. They're telling a new story. I, I have to agree. I liked the film. It was interesting. While it did, you know, they did try to tie up all the endings. They did try to make sure they included everything. Xavier, oh, he's going to lose the use of his legs here. We've got to make sure we get that in. We've got to make sure... Mystique goes over to the yeah, dark Mystique side. Yeah, Mystique goes to the dark side before it's over. Uh, Magneto's in his costume. Right, yeah, all that stuff they had to get in in time. And it did seem a little bit rushed. Some of the things would have been better had they saved them for the sequel, if there will ever be such a thing. But yeah, I mean, that's hard because you don't know if there will ever be such a thing. And uh, you can't rely on that happening and being able to pay it off later. And that's something that I always talk about. Of course you can. It's a billion dollar franchise. <laughs> this was the fifth movie. Just because there is a fifth movie doesn't mean you're going to be part of the sixth movie. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I guess. But the producers were the same. Brian Singer, Lauren Schuler Donner, they've been with it through all four, five. Five, right? Five. I don't think they're going anywhere. I don't know. It, the, the, I, let me focus on one moment, though, in the film. There was a training montage in the center of X-Men First Class, which I think was the closest that you get to the magic of what those comic books were. It was just so fun, and it showed each one of their characters, and each one was trying to hone their abilities, Mm -hmm. and Xavier was trying to show them in Magneto. And and I just, I loved that sequence. I guess it was similar to a training montage in an 80s movie, except for you didn't get a pop song. There was actual dialogue and stuff. But, oh, it was just really cool, and it would just jump from character to character and show how they were getting better at what they were doing. And I loved that part. I had just a big dopey grin on my face (laughs) through that whole thing. And the putting the band together scene before that where they were going and trying to recruit new mutants was really, really good. And it just had that great capper with them running into Wolverine. Uh I loved those two scenes. I I think they did did well with making characters that were likable and interesting. Uh, the, The kid that they got to be Beast... He was just this geeky, nervous, really likable guy. Uh-huh. Yeah, they turned him blue, which maybe they didn't need to do <laughs> yeah. but, so that it would tie in. But yeah, it had to have been tying into X-Men 3. So it's not like they didn't count X-Men 3. You know, I was, thinking about, you know, I was thinking about that. You remember the part at the end of X-Men 3 when they were going out and Beast puts on his freaking uniform. Isn't it the same uh, jackets that they were wearing at the start of this film? I don't and he's, think he so. puts it on, he's like, oh, I can't believe this used to fit me. And it's the black jacket with the yellow X in the front of it. And they, that's what they wore in this film as well. So I just thought that was, that was pretty cool. But, you know, the stuff with uh, teaching Banshee to fly, and that was just so cool. And teaching Havoc to control his plasma rings or whatever, you know, he created was really neat. No, I, did, I feel like there was too much stuff going on in here because just the relationship between Xavier and Mystique and Mystique and Beast were both really good, but I think they could have done more. And I guess there was a relationship between Mystique and Magneto, but I believe I blinked. So I missed <laughs> it. Because there were so many darn characters, because you you had a bunch of evil mutants at the same time. Right. Like, like Azazel, did we find out anything about him? Did no, he, I, he was just a henchman, really. And then the, the other guy, I think he was... I, I, I looked him up later. I think he was supposed to be Riptide, which was another X-Men villain, but he just made... Or he maybe just not made ripped. tornadoes with his hands. Gosh, maybe it's a different character. I, I don't know. But, but Would it be in uh, IMDb? But, uh, it might be. But you had just so many darn characters that not everybody could shine. And it's a shame because a couple of those moments were really good and it's too bad that you know they didn't get to continue... Oh, I realize we've been talking a long time again. And what's funny is it always comes as a shock to me (laughs) that I could talk for an hour. Oh, no. Of course I can. We do it every week. Yes, we do. And I am now yawning, so I think it's time to uh, call it for the night. That's right. Somebody somewhere said that these That Gets My Goats aren't supposed to be that long. And so we will hit the break and we'll come back in a few days 
with the final part of our talk of X-Men First Class. All right? Sounds good. Good night. See ya. That gets my goat, or whatever this is ultimately called, is produced under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Very sad.